As we have seen in our previous videos, Jesus' battles with Satan, the sea in Galilee, and with death in Jerusalem are linked together by Mark's central way section. This middle section is broadly based on the sacred way and is itself concluded by a processional entry into Jerusalem modeled explicitly on the tabernacle's enthronement procession. Though traditionally this procession ended with the enthronement of Yahweh or the ark within the temple, in Mark, the procession ends abruptly as an anticlimax. Jesus, entering the temple, simply looks around and then leaves. There is no enthronement. No proclamation of Jesus has become king. The way of enthronement, Psalms declare, Yahweh has become king. There are only frustrated expectations. Why? We have already suggested one reason. As in the traditional progression of the ritual, Jesus must first leave the temple before its repurification can take place. However, this but delays the expected enthronement. It does not stop it. The expectation, though delayed, remains, and Jesus must be enthroned. And this indeed happens. After cleansing the temple and battling the occupying evil in Jerusalem, he is not in the temple enthroned, but on the cross. True to the reinterpretation of the Son of Man's role, the eschatological divine warrior does not take his throne and kingship in the expected manner. To think he would is but to think in human terms, not the terms of God. Mark records Jesus as offering us a new set of expectations, that the divine warrior will only gain true victory once he has been killed and brought back to life. He thus delays the consummation of the procession until Jesus' crucifixion, the true Messiah's glory. As a setup to this final assumption of kingship, Mark narrates the anointing of Jesus at Bethany in Mark 14, 3-9, an event permitting multiple interpretations. The one explicitly offered by Jesus is that she has anointed my body beforehand for its burial, thus foreshadowing his crucifixion. However, given that Jesus' crucifixion is also his enthronement, one is permitted another reading. She is anointing Jesus as king, so death and royal glory are again equated. Finally, we have already noted that Bethany means house of Ananiah and may have been traditionally related to another house, which stood near the summit of Olivet, the house of Obed-Edom. Having considered the whole Mesala complex, which linked the house of Obed-Edom and the ancient Israelite serpent stone, as well as the similarities of the serpent stone with the Hittite Huasi stones and the Amorite sacred stones, it is remarkable that both the Hittite and Amorite sacred stones were ritually anointed as part of festive processions of the storm god. In the Hittite case, we know this practice occurred specifically during the new year. Mark gives his audience the unexpected conclusion to the events begun in chapter 11, the coronation and proclamation of Jesus as king. However, this comes not from the Jews in celebration, but mockingly from the Roman soldiers in derision. Mark 15, 16 through 20 reads, And the soldiers led him inside the palace, which is the praetorium, and they called together the whole cohort. And they dressed him in a purple robe, and, having woven an acanthus crown, put it on him. And they began to greet him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were beating his head with a stick, and spitting on him, and, bending their knees, did homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple robe and dressed him with his cloak, and they led him out to crucify him. This is the true assumption of Jesus' kingship in Mark's radical new schema of expectations for the Son of Man. This is his earthly acquisition of dominion, presented as a stark inversion of its cosmic archetype in Daniel 7. Daniel 7 reads, I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and it was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. So the Roman soldiers, in mocking Jesus, ironically declare what the reader, but no one else in Mark's gospel already knows. Jesus is the king. The mocking salute to Jesus, Hail, King of the Jews, is Mark's functional equivalent of Jesus has become king, in the traditional sense as pronounced in the enthronement psalms. Now, as Jesus is removed to Golgotha for execution, Mark seems to echo scenes from the Hebrew Bible which depict the transportation of the ark into the temple. He writes, And they carry him to Golgotha place, which means the place of the skull. And some commenters have noted the peculiar usage of the Greek verb phero here, usually translated into English as brought. While the word itself can be translated variously depending on context, its most basic sense is to bear or carry a load. So Collins notes that scholars such as William Campbell and T.E. Schmidt have, each for their own purposes, respectively translated the verb more literally to carry or to bear. In fact, Schmidt suggests that bearing of Jesus recalls how Roman military leaders were born in triumphal processions. Perhaps, however, Mark is echoing a different kind of triumphal procession, the bearing of Yahweh's Ark to his temple for enthronement. We saw this same theme at work in Jesus' entry procession, but the idea is more subtle here since it hinges on an elusive syntax. So we find that the transfer of the Ark to the temple is twice described in the Hebrew Bible in quite similar terms. First we have 2 Samuel 6.17, and they carry the Ark of the Lord and set it in its place, which they use the same Greek word phero. The next is 1 Kings 8.6, and the priests carry the Ark to its place. The same root verb here is again seen, phero. Sigmund Moenkel believes that these passages were ritual scripts for the enthronement procession at the Feast of Tabernacles. Concerning the first, he writes that this story hardly deals with something that happened just once, but rather with a legend reflecting fixed cultic customs, the rite of a festal day, from a house outside the temple precincts to the festal procession with Yahweh's Ark probably used to proceed at the festival of harvest. New Year and Enthronement, which was also the festival for the consecration of the temple. The similar account in 1 Kings is modeled after the first procession and thus served as another account of the enthronement ritual. By comparison, Mark 15.22 reads, And they carry him to Golgotha place, which means the place of the skull. The similarity of the passages is clear all use the historical present of the verb phero in the third person plural and emphasize the destination of the holy object as a particular place. Though even if these similarities are purely coincidental, as admittedly the specific words are rather common, certainly the image of Jesus, the physical presence of Yahweh on earth, being carried by a group who seek to enthrone him upon a cross would signal a clear enough parallel with the bearing of the Ark for enthronement in the temple. After Jesus is carried to Golgotha Place, he is finally crucified. Mark clearly presents this as Jesus' glorious enthronement, as various aspects of his depiction suggest. Mark 15, 25-28 read, Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him, and an inscription of his charge had been written overhead, the king of the Jews, and two criminals are crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. First, the kingship of Jesus is emphasized by the placard, the king of the Jews, and one would expect a throne as the proper place for a triumphant king. But the reinterpretation of the divine warrior that the Mark and Jesus proposed earlier in the gospel demands that one see his cross as his glory. Second, and more importantly, the detail that Jesus is crucified between two bandits, one on his right and one on his left, makes the connection with enthronement all but explicit. The configuration recalls the request made by James and John in chapter 10 to be enthroned with Jesus on his right and left at the glorious apocalyptic end. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, 
come to him, saying to him, Teacher, we wish it that you might do what we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you wish me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant to us that we might sit, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup which I drink, or to be baptized in the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup which I drink you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared. This request, says Collins, presupposes that Jesus will be enthroned as king and judge of the new age as God's agent. Indeed, that Jesus' enthronement was imminent apparently seemed obvious to James and John. After all, their request comes as the disciples are on the way going up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading them in a procession, who himself emphasizes, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, after which he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Taking this enthronement of Jesus for granted, the sons of Zebedee ask to sit on either side of him in his impending glory. But as Jesus' response makes it clear, this request is based on a faulty, traditional notion of the divine warrior's enthronement. Jesus replies, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup which I drink or to be baptized in the baptism with which I am baptized? Perkins makes the connection here between Jesus' baptism of suffering with the chaos waters, noting, Old Testament references to water overwhelming the sufferer in lament psalms may have provided the origin for this metaphor. Indeed, Psalm 42 contrasts the overwhelming chaos waters with the joy of the Feast of Booths. It reads, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God, with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Yet deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts, all your waves and your billows have gone over me. Psalm 69 also recalls the mythological background of the overwhelming waters. Do not let the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. That Mark had this verse in mind when writing of the crucifixion is evidenced by Mark 15.36, where the soldiers offer Jesus sour wine, an allusion to Psalm 69.21. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. If we take Perkins' suggestion seriously, which we should, we see that Mark is making yet another connection between Jesus' battle with death on the cross and the chaos comf tradition. His death is baptism in the overwhelming chaos waters. In any event, Jesus assures them that they are truly ignorant of what it means to be enthroned with him. His enthronement will be on his cross. His enthronement is his death. James and John, like Peter before, have their minds not on the things of God, but on the things of men. They are working within traditional notions of kingship, power, authority, and the Son of Man, which Jesus again, using this opportunity, attempts to redefine. Mark 10, 41-5 reads, And hearing this, the ten began to be annoyed with James and John. So calling them to himself, Jesus says to them, you know that the ones recognized to rule over the Gentiles have power over them, and that their great men exercise their authority over them. But it is not so among you all. But whoever might wish to be great among you shall be your servant, and whoever might wish to be first among you shall be the slave of all. For indeed, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for all. So Jesus denies the request. They do not understand what it takes to be enthroned as Jesus understands enthronement, and so will not be on his right or left in his glory. Instead, this position of glory is taken by the two robbers for whom it has been prepared. Collins summarizes all of this succinctly. Finally, this portrayal of Jesus' crucifixion between two robbers reprises the request of James and John in 1037. The evocation of the earlier text in the account of the crucifixion elaborates the ironic portrayal of Jesus as king that already characterized Mark's source. 
Jesus hangs on a cross with a placard announcing his kingship, but James and John are not with him because of their fear of suffering and death. They abandon him and the places of honor are filled by men who are unworthy. So Mark directly connects Jesus' crucifixion with the rising expectation of his enthronement. Another element to do so is the structuring of the crucifixion itself around Psalm 22. Surprisingly though, it has long been recognized that Psalm 22 is at work in Mark 15. No commentators have investigated its links with enthronement and the significance this might play in Mark's crucifixion enthronement paradigm. It is clear that the casting of lots for Jesus' clothing is based on Psalm 22.18 and that the motif of mockers shaking their heads at him is based on Psalm 22.7. More powerfully, however, the very first words of Psalm 22 are the very last words of the Mark in Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, for all this, overlooked are the Psalm's words immediately following this cry, which refer to Yahweh enthroned. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. Though the speaker of the psalm, and now Jesus himself, cries out in desperation and abandonment, the following verse rings through with the vision of hope an adversative realization of Yahweh's power in the face of life's suffering. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Jesus appears to be abandoned in his crucifixion, but surely an audience conversant in the Psalms could not help but hear this hopeful answer echoing in their heads to the psalmist's plight. It is as though salvation itself were transposed upon the scene of despair victory beaming simultaneous with defeat. In short, a masterful stroke for an author keen to show glory and suffering and a divine warrior crucified. There seems to be only one, though crucial, example of Jesus defeating the forces of death in Mark's gospel, and that is his resurrection. This victory is his final and conclusive one, and in this respect parallels Yahweh's defeat of death, and so indirectly Baal's defeat of death. Thus, what E. Theodore Molin says of the Canaanite combat myth is also relevant here. The progression in the myth is logical. To ensure the fertility and stability of the cosmos, the storm god must first make the universe secure from Yam and the chaotic forces of the sea. Next, he must overcome the forces of death and sterility, an equally important conflict. In a similar sense, Jesus must first make the universe secure from Satan and the chaotic forces of the sea. Next, he must overcome the power of death. And we've already dealt with the use of Canaanite imagery in Jewish apocalypticism, noting that the ancient Israelites shared many Canaanite conceptions of the combat myth, which were transmitted all the way down to the first century CE and beyond, perhaps via the traditional continuity of the tabernacle's cultus. Across the centuries, ancient Hebrew texts show a conception of death much akin to the Canaanite deity. In that continuing tradition, he remained the insatiable devourer. Proverbs 27.20 declares that Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied. Figures clearly personified in Job 28.22, Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. Indeed, evidence shows that they were still appreciated as personified divine beings in apocalyptic literature of the first century CE. Revelation 9, for example, describes Abaddon as a netherworldly king and fallen angel. It reads, And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given authority like the authority of scorpions on earth. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. Thus, mythic conceptions of death, specifically those from the combat myth, were demonstrably maintained well into the apocalyptic period. Such texts evince a much vaster living mythology 
than is immediately apparent in the Hebrew Bible, one which likely included a battle between Yahweh and death. John J. Collins asserts there can be no doubt that many more mythological traditions were transmitted in Second Temple Judaism than are now extant in the Hebrew Bible. Glimpses of such traditions can be seen in Isaiah 24 through 27, which alludes to Leviathan, the destruction of Mot or death, and an enigmatic punishment of the host of heaven. Indeed, the combat myth between Yahweh and death seems to have gained great prominence in the apocalyptic period, no doubt due, at least in part, to the growing inclusion of an afterlife in Jewish theology. Belief in resurrection, and thus the ultimate destruction of death's power, began in the apocalyptic period and is one of the theological features distinguishing it from older Jewish religion. It is no surprise then that we find a mythic combat with death employed by apocalyptic writers, especially those of the New Testament. So Paul alludes to it, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is here the last enemy enemy, Eskatos Echros. Just as he was in the traditional progression of the combat myth. Moreover, Death's position beneath the feet of Yahweh may recall his fate in the combat myth, as he too was probably trampled. So Albright's translation of Habakkuk reads, In fury you trod upon the earth, in anger you trampled nations. You came forth to save your people, to save your anointed. You crushed the head of wicked death, destroying him, tail end to neck. And Paul continues his mythological allusions for the Corinthians a few verses later. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here, Paul alludes to the two mythic instances of death in the Old Testament. The Isaianic Apocalypse in 25.8 and Hosea 13.14 both likely reflect the combat between Yahweh and death. Indeed, Paul refers to death's defeat as a victory, accomplished through Jesus, making Jesus the divine warrior just as Yahweh was. A similar sentiment is found in Romans 5.14 and 17. Yet death was king from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. If, because of one of the men's trespasses, death ruled as king through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness rule in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Here, Paul takes the illusion further and speaks of death ruling as king, thereby invoking the combat myth's political theme of contested kingship. Like the ancient Mot, death presumably had a kingdom. In keeping with the apocalyptic mentality, it reigned, in fact, over all the earth. But Jesus overthrows death as king to usher in instead the kingdom of God. In the defeat of death, apocalyptic eschatology in 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 5, Martinus de Boer succinctly summarizes much of this Pauline conception of death. In both 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 5, Paul understands the anthropological reality of death in accordance with the traditions of Jewish cosmological apocalyptic eschatology as an inimicil, murderous, quasi-angelic power that had 
held all Adamic humanity in subjection and enslavement. Death is hypostased as a power external to human beings, which nevertheless exerts and manifests its hegemony over and among human beings. Indeed, it must be said that Paul cosmologizes or mythologizes death for his readers. Clearly, Paul conceived of death in a mythic sense, or at the very least could express his theological ideas in terms of a traditional myth. Either way, his writings reveal that the ancient combat between Yahweh and death was still alive and salient, particularly for articulating to early Christian communities the salvific work accomplished by Jesus through his death and resurrection. Nowhere is such a mythological understanding of death more explicit than in the book of Revelation. Revelation 20 offers perhaps the strongest evidence that the myth of Yahweh's combat with death was not only current in the first century CE, but actively serving apocalyptic Christian communities as they sought to articulate the significance of Jesus' death and resurrection. So we find Jesus following the traditional progression of the myth as after binding the dragon, he turns his wrath on death. Revelation 20, 14 through 21, 1. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. One particularly striking aspect of this passage is the mention of both death and Hades, since the Greek word Hades frequently translated to the Hebrew Sheol another name for death himself. Thus, it is not different entities cast into the fire here, but one, the old enemy from the combat myth, Mont or Sheol, whose epithets are given in poetic parallel, Yom and Judge River. So death maintained the mythical resonances he had had when the writers of the Hebrew Bible employed them, although this mythology was still potent and accessible to first century authors. Mark clearly does not employ it in an overtly mythical way. Such applications of the myth may have been suited to the apocalyptic vision of John of Patmos, but for Mark, portraying Jesus was literally slaying a personified death, or better, swallowing him, was simply not an option. The manner of presentation should not, however, prevent our recognition of its mythic undertones. That Jesus was understood by Christians to have defeated death by his crucifixion and resurrection is clear. The manner of this defeat, however, is rather different from direct combat. Jesus defeats death by overcoming the power of death, that is, by his resurrection. But for this, he must first die. And so, for the first time, Jesus must be defeated by the chaos enemy. Dominic Rudman offers an insightful analysis of Jesus' death in just these terms in his article, The Crucifixion as Chaos Kampf, a new reading of the Passion narrative in the Synoptic Gospels. Rudman clearly asserts that the crucifixion is expressed literarily as a chaos kampf, but one in which the powers of chaos are victorious. To argue this thesis, he points to 1. The spread of the darkness at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, two, the motif of the creator's death, and three, the tearing of the temple curtain. I shall consider each of these arguments and along the way posit additional evidence for seeing the Mark in crucifixion as a combat myth in which Jesus is defeated before proving victorious. In 1533, Mark writes, and when the sixth hour came, a darkness came over the whole earth until the ninth hour. Rudman sees this as a telling detail, signaling the ascension of chaos in the cosmos. Biblical texts strongly associate darkness or night with the forces of chaos. Darkness is synonymous with chaos in the form of non-existence in Job 3, 3-6, through 6, or crime such as Proverbs 2 or 13, and is therefore particularly associated with shale, the place where the human essence resides after death. Indeed, there are many other texts Rudman does not cite which solidify this association. Job, for example, proclaims, Are not my days few? Cease then and let me alone, that I may take comfort for a little. Before I go, whence I shall not return, even to the land of darkness of the shadow of death. 
the land dark as midnight, the shadow of death, and chaos where the light is as midnight. Here, death and shale are explicitly linked with chaos and deep darkness, where even light is like darkness. Elsewhere in Job, death and the darkness of the depths of the chaos waters are equated in poetic parallelism. Job 38, 16 through 18 reads, Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked into the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? The spread of darkness over the whole land at Jesus' crucifixion thus implies the ascendancy of death and chaos as Jesus is defeated. This fits well with the other combat myths we have seen, where the defeat of the storm god means the ascendancy of death and sterility. Moreover, the spread of unusual darkness is also found in the ancient Mesopotamian combat myths, as when the sun stops and the day turns black as Ninurta battles the Azag, or when darkness covers the mountain as Ninurta battles Anzu. Darkness is thus associated with death, but with chaos more generally. Mark's statement in 1533 that, quote, a darkness came over the whole earth may echo Genesis 1-2, which says that at creation, the earth was formless and uncrafted and darkness covered the deep. With Jesus' alleged defeat on the cross, the earth has been plunged back into the state of chaos that characterized it before creation. Indeed, this regression into chaos was fundamental to the ancient Near Eastern conception of the New Year. This was the very reason why the victory of the storm god was celebrated at the New Year festival, since his victory meant that fertility and life would return after chaos's defeat. Every year, the world regressed into chaos, and every year at the New Year festival, Yahweh's enthronement signaled the defeat of death and the return of life. So here, before Jesus' life returns at his resurrection, the world is in the trough of death. Chaos has assumed its temporary dominance over the cosmos. Remember, the combat myth was often cosmogonical in nature, given that its central focus was the re-establishment of an ordered cosmos. The forces of chaos assert their dominance over the orderly cosmos and its life-bringing storm god ultimately to be tamed and destroyed by that resurgent deity. Order is thus reinstated, and out of the chaos comes the structure of an ordered cosmos, making the myth a story of recreation. With respect to the crucifixion, Jesus clearly fulfills the role of a divine warrior traditionally held by Yahweh, the creator of the world. So, Rudman concludes, the death of this creator figure on the cross is, in a sense, the ultimate victory of chaos over creation. Indeed, Mark presents Jesus' crucifixion as a true defeat more than any other evangelist. Apart from his final cry of anguish and abandonment, quoting Psalm 22:1, the only sound Jesus is said to make on the cross is the cry of a great voice. At 1534, we read, Jesus shouted with a great voice. And at 1537, Interestingly, this is precisely what the demons were said to do when Jesus defeated them. Now that Jesus is the one being defeated, it is his mighty voice that is not powerful enough to overcome the opposition. God's mighty rebuke is finally not strong enough to conquer the enemy. In this way, Mark employs the language of spiritual warfare to describe Jesus' battle against death here. Unlike all the battles before, however, Jesus is the one being beaten here although temporarily. When Jesus dies, at which moment, the curtain of the temple was split in two from top to bottom. Rudman argues that since the tabernacle was understood as a microcosm of creation, this is the key moment signifying the triumph of death and chaos over Jesus and the orderly cosmos. This interpretation is based on Josephus, who writes that the sanctuary had golden doors before which hung a curtain made of materials that typified the universe. The rending of this curtain thus signifies a dissolution of the world. Creation has been undone and chaos reigns again. Rudman states this succinctly, noting that 
The establishing and maintenance of boundaries against the seer death is crucial to the process of creation and its preservation in the Old Testament. The dissolution of such boundaries could therefore be seen as signifying a victory by the forces of chaos. It is surely significant that this action happens at the precise moment of Jesus' death, when chaos has triumphed and all is in despair. At this moment, Jesus' victory remains three days in the future. However, other significances might also be at play. Overlooked by Rudman and others, for example, is the connection between the rending of the curtain and the allusion to the combat with death in Isaiah 25, 7-8. through And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. If this is what lies behind Mark's torn curtain, then the shroud or sheet is not so much the symbolic cosmos thrown into total chaos by death of Jesus, but a negative element that blocks God's intimacy and connection with his people, one which Jesus' death abolishes. It is precisely at this moment of his death, then, that Jesus is victorious. The shroud is torn and God has swallowed death. Given the fundamental paradox of Jesus' crucifixion, as discussed at the outset, his victory and defeat, his death which brings life, we may not need to choose between these two seemingly contradictory interpretations. It is only after Jesus' deposition and burial in the final lines of the gospel that we find the climactic assurance of Jesus' total victory over death. There we read how the women who had been at the crucifixion set out to anoint Jesus' dead body. Mark notes that the time was early morning when the sun had risen. A detail appreciated by Joel Marcus, who perceptively posits that the ascent of the sun at Jesus' resurrection reverses the darkness of his crucifixion. The ascendancy of chaos has ended. The women find the tomb empty and an angelic messenger who proclaims, He has been risen, he is not here. With this declaration, Mark offers his audience the good news of Jesus Christ. Boring's good news from the battlefield. Jesus has proven victorious over his enemies, even death. Longman and Reed note, there's no question who has won the eschatological battle. Even if the reaction of the women is ironically characterized by the archetypal fear that seizes those who encounter Yahweh as the divine warrior, the victim has emerged the victor. But for Mark and his audience, the final victory still lay in the future. Jesus' victory over death was just the first fruits of the coming harvest. The complete victory over death would come when all of those in Christ would be resurrected. So, Mark 13, 26 through 27 reads, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Or Paul's assurance in 1 Thessalonians that the divine warrior would come again. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Such are the consequences of Jesus' victory over death. This is what Mark and his audience were eagerly awaiting. Only then, when they saw the rider of the clouds coming in victory, could they unequivocally proclaim, Jesus has become king. So the typology of the combat myth is complete with Jesus' resurrection. The divine warrior, having slain the dragon and subdued the raging sea, made his triumphant procession to the temple. He was crowned and enthroned, only to face a confrontation with death, which he loses, so the divine warrior dies. The forces of chaos gain ascendancy over the cosmos, but their temporary dominance does not last long. The hero recovers, coming back to life to defeat the power of death. 
Then his eternal authority is recognized and he indeed becomes the uncontested king over the cosmos. So the ancient mythic pattern born in the mythocultic systems of the ancient Near East becomes enshrined as Christian gospel, the product of a millennia long series of transformations from ancient Near Eastern genre to Israelite truth, prophetic metaphor, apocalyptic vision, gospel, and finally religious creed alive and thriving today in the 21st century and beyond, showing fundamentally who God is, revealing to us that he has become incarnate as the man we know, Jesus.